Hi, I'm going to be talking to you today about two different topics, uh, which are commonly seen in women with cardiovascular disease. I'm going to spend the majority of the time talking about MINOCA, which is myocardial infarction in non-obstructive coronary artery disease, um, which I will submit to you as a working diagnosis. And the second topic is Takotsubo cardiomyopathy in 2020. Um, so I'm going to start with a case uh, of a 57-year-old woman who presented with chest pain. She was a former smoker with no other cardiovascular risk factors uh, who presented with substernal chest pain that woke her out of sleep. The pain radiated to her left arm and her back. Um, she had noticed a recent increase in stress due to her ex-husband suffering a cardiac event and her mother passing away. She had no history of vasospastic phenomena, such as Raynaud's disease or migraine headaches. Her cardiac exam was normal, and she had an elevation in her high-sensitivity troponin, initially 350, and then on repeat, it fell to 299. Her EKG is shown here, which you can review, but essentially it showed normal sinus rhythm at a rate of 60 beats per minute with no ischemic STT changes. However, given her presentation of the chest pain with the troponin elevation, she met criteria for a non-ST elevation MI, so she underwent coronary angiography. Shown here is her right coronary artery. Um, you may notice at the very origin of the right coronary artery, there's a slight pinching of the vessel, and there was a concern that possibly there was a little bit of vasospasm there from the catheter but no obstructive coronary disease was shown here, uh, no tapering of the vessel or sudden cutoff. Um, and then on the left side, the circumflex artery coming down on the front of the screen here, um, and then the left anterior descending artery across here, again, no obstructive coronary disease. There was no sudden tapering of the vessel. And here is the uh, additional views showing the left anterior descending artery coming down here and the circumflex artery here, again, with no obstructive disease. So she meets the definition of Minoka. Um, she had a cardiac MRI in addition to help uh, confirm the diagnosis. Um, and you can see here, it's very subtle. Hopefully you can see my pointer in the lateral wall um, of her um, left ventricle. There's a little bit of hang up um, in terms of the decreased thickening of the myocardium. And again, shown here again in the lateral wall, there is a little bit of T2 weighted enhancement showing edema and then some late gadolinium enhancement of the lateral wall shown with the arrows uh, showing scarring, um, which provides more evidence for the infarction. So what is the definition of MINOCA or myocardial infarction in non-obstructive coronary arteries? Um, the idea of this uh, began in the 1980s when we uh, had early coronary angiograms. Um, showing that only 90% of patients who presented with an ST elevation MI actually had an occluded artery, um, and 26% of patients with a non-ST elevation MI had an occluded artery. And up to 5 to 10% of patients who presented with an acute MI had non-obstructive coronary disease. I would say about 6% is the average in a recent meta-analysis. The picture on the right here is um, showing thrombus or, or enhancement with the dye in the, in the left uh, anterior descending artery in this very early angiogram. The dye has already washed out of the circumflex artery. So we've known about Minoka for a long time, but it's been with advances in imaging techniques that we've come to understand it a little bit better. So uh, the definition of Minoka starts with an acute MI, and there's been many definitions of acute MI. We're now at our fourth universal definition of MI, which is as follows, uh, rise and fall, um, or simply a fall in cardiac biomarkers with at least one value being above the 99th percentile of the upper reference limit. There also has to be clinical evidence of infarction with at least one of the following, symptoms of ischemia, new STT changes or left bundle branch block, and new pathologic Q waves. There has to be imaging evidence of new loss of viable myocardium, uh, such as regional wall motion abnormalities 
or intracoronary thrombus. So one of these plus the troponin elevation or fall. Um, to meet the criteria for Minoka, there has to be non-obstructive coronary artery disease on angiography, um, defined as less than 50% stenosis. And there has to be no other clinically overt cause of the presentation, such as pulmonary embolism, myocarditis, some other clear reason for the elevation in troponin. Um, so this is the clinical characteristics of patients who present with a Minoka. Um, the table on the left, I'll get into in a minute, but that's from a meta-analysis of 28, patient, uh, 28 studies uh, looking at patients with Minoka. So the mean age was 59. 43% were women, uh, which compares differently to patients who have men MI with obstructive coronary disease, where that number is closer to 23%. Um, traditional cardiac risk factors uh, were common uh, and similar, actually, in prevalence to patients who presented with MI and coronary disease, with the exception, potentially, of hyperlipidemia. Um, so if I bring your attention over here to this table, um, the MICAD and the MINOCA columns here, two and three, are from the six studies which compared characteristics of MI with coronary disease to MI with non-obstructive disease. And in these six studies, there actually was a difference in the prevalence of hyperlipidemia. However, when you include all of the other studies, the other 22 studies included, that difference was actually not um, as uh, present. So, uh, in general, I would say that the presented characteristics are similar, with, except that women are more commonly found to have Minoka. Um, so, so how does Minoka happen? What is the differential diagnosis? How do we get this clinical syndrome and troponin elevation without obstruction on the coronary angiogram? So um, on the left here, um, you see uh, places where there's actually disruption of the endothelium. So plaque rupture, which we know is a common cause of MI with obstructive coronary disease, or plaque erosion, which is slightly different. Uh, plaque erosion occurs when there's apoptosis of the endothelial lining and loss of connection between the endothelial cells and the extracellular matrix. And the idea is there, a thrombus probably forms on that disrupted um, endothelium or eroded endothelium and embolizes distally so that by the time of the angiogram, we are not able to see it because it's in a small part of the vessel. Plaque rupture is where there is rupture of the thin fibrous cap over the um, lining of the endothelium, and again, thrombus formation with the idea that likely this has resolved by the time of the angiogram. Inside to thrombosis, similar process, and spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which we'll hear about at different times during this course. Um, sometimes that can be subtle on an angiogram, and a patient may be diagnosed with Minoka. A scab may uh, show up as just a tapering of the distal vessel where the, the lumen is, is narrow in size, and then it suddenly um, becomes smaller um, as the dissection compresses on the true lumen. On the right side, we have um, examples of Minoka or causes of Minoka where there's not actually a uh, disruption in the endothelial lining, so supply demand mismatch, um, such as a, a, an arrhythmia, uh, which the demand for oxygen outstrips the supply and, and potentially mildly obstructive to vessels, coronary vasospasm, um, or coronary microvascular disease. Um, either one of those when the supply demand mismatch is big enough could cause an elevation in troponin with symptoms. To diagnose vasospasm, sometimes provocative testing um, needs to be undertaken. That is not commonly done uh, here at Mass General. Um, it's only done in specific sites and it's also not done at the time of the acute infarct, but that's where patients are given intracoronary acetylcholine, for example, to try to um, provoke spasm. Um, and then on the left side of the screen to demonstrate plaque rupture or plaque erosion, lots of times we need specialized intracoronary imaging techniques such as intravascular ultrasound or preferably OCT or optical coherence tomography, which has a better uh, resolution for detecting um, subtle disruption in the endothelial lining. So this is sort of a schema showing possible mechanisms for Minoka. And you can imagine that 
understanding what caused a Minoka is important because we may treat it with different medications. Um, so this is from the American Heart Association scientific statement on Minoka, and it's a busy diagram, but I think it's worth um, reviewing. And I'm going to start systematically with the, the red and then go to the yellow and then go to the green. Um, so looking across the top here, um, there's a clinical presentation, which is consistent with Minoka um, that we just described. Um, and then the clinical context needs to be investigated. Um, so is there some other obvious cause? So moving over to the third column, is there sepsis? Is there a pulmonary embolism? Was there a cardiac contusion? Other myriad number of, of diagnoses that can cause an elevation in uh, troponin? Um, or was it non-cardiac troponin? Was it from skeletal muscle? Um, but if there's no other obvious cause found, you have a working diagnosis of Minoka, which means we have the diagnosis, but we need to try to figure out what's going on. So um, the thought there is to go back and review more carefully the angiogram. Did we miss a subtle SCAD? Did we miss a sudden vessel cutoff? Was there some um, clue there as to what might have been the mechanism of this event? Um, an echocardiogram can be helpful. Sometimes we may see wall motion abnormalities, which look more consistent with a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy than a focal wall motion abnormality, which might be more consistent with an acute infarct. Um, and uh, third, a cardiac MRI, as was done in the first case, can be helpful to look for evidence of um, myocarditis, which shows up as patchy gadolinium enhancement or patchy scarring as in, compared with the, the case that we saw initially where there was focal scarring, uh, which was more than 50% of the um, myocardium. So once we've um, done a little more due diligence, we've looked for evidence of Takotsubo or myocarditis or SCAD. If we find none of those, which again are sort of in the differential of Minoka, but once we make that diagnosis, they're no longer considered Minoka. They're considered distinct entities. We again have the diagnosis of Minoka, and that's where intracoronary imaging with IVIS or OCT to look for, for other subtleties that we might have missed on a, on a gross look at the angiogram can be helpful. And finally, coronary functional assessment or uh, pressure wire technique where we measure a drop in pressure across the stenosis, which might initially appear moderate, but maybe in retrospect is a little more significant and could have been a culprit lesion. Um, and finally, we may have done all that investigation and there are cases and we've all probably taken care of patients uh, where the diagnosis is just not clear and we remain uh, with a diagnosis of unclassified Minoka. So I just want to um, describe cardiac MRI and how this may be helpful in the diagnosis as it was uh, in the initial patient just to confirm the presence of infarct. So in a large study of patients who presented with Minoka, um, typical subendocardial infarct was present in about 24%. Myocarditis was found in about 33% and no abnormality was seen in 24%. Although in a meta-analysis, this ranged from eight to 67%. It's also interesting that uh, one study looked at patients with a normal cardiac MRI who also had intravascular um, ultrasound, and they found that up to 25% of patients who'd had intravascular ultrasound had a demonstrated plaque rupture despite the normal MRI. So an MRI is not perfect. Um, and, and you can imagine if the gadolinium enhancement is such a small area, it could be missed um, on, a, on an MRI. Here's another study. This was uh, 125 patients um, where they had a Minoka and they underwent cardiac MRI. Um, and then they compared the diagnosis um, from a panel of three cardiologists who looked at the rest of the clinical data and came to a conclusion as to whether the patient had had a Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which is the TTC, had had an acute MI or had myocarditis. Um, and so you can see here in the, in the um, dark blue bar, these were the patients who had Takotsubo based on cardiac MRI. And only about two thirds of the patients were determined to have Takotsubo by the three cardiology panel. Um, 
And then similarly, patients who had had an acute infarct based on MRI, again, it wasn't all um, of them who had been diagnosed with um, acute MI based on the other clinical data. So overall in this study, the MRI changed the diagnosis um, in about 50% of patients. And an MRI was able to make a diagnosis in about 87% of patients. So potentially a very helpful study, um, particularly in the acute setting when we're trying to understand um, the etiology for the presentation. So what is the prognosis in patients who've had Minoka? These are patients who are often younger and who um, have an infarct, but then aren't found to have obstructive coronary disease. It's actually not as good as you might predict. So about 25% of patients will continue to experience angina over a 12 month period. About a quarter of them will have a major adverse cardiac event. The in-hospital mortality is about 1% and the one-year mortality in, again, in this meta-analysis was about 5% which is fairly similar um, to the MI with coronary disease, um, 12 month mortality of 6.7%. This number may be younger, uh, maybe lower and is lower in younger patients. So in the Virgo study, which enrolled patients with an acute infarct between the ages of 18 and 55, they found that in patients with Minoka, the one year mortality was more like 1.7%. There are no good randomized trials looking at medical management of patients who present with Minoka. This is from the Sweet Heart Registry, which looked at about 10,000 patients with Minoka between the years of 2003 and 2013. Um, and they showed that it, patients treated with statins um, did have some benefit. Um, patients treated with uh, ACE inhibitors also had benefit with significant hazard ratios. Um, an improvement uh, in their overall uh, major adverse cardiac events. However, patients with beta blockers had a non-significant trend uh, towards benefit and patients treated with dual antiplatelet therapy had no statistically significant benefit, which is surprising when you consider that a large number of these patients um, likely had plaque rupture um, or disruption of plaque in some way. There is um, an ongoing trial right now, which is enrolling called the Minoka BAT trial, which is actively enrolling patients with Minoka and is randomizing them um, to ACE inhibitors um, and um, beta blockers. And so we may have a little bit more information that study is, is uh, scheduled to be done around 2024. So in conclusion, given that Minoka has similar features to MI with coronary disease, a guarded prognosis and multiple potential causes, it should be considered a working diagnosis that requires further evaluation of the potential underlying causes because these may have important clinical implications. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit now um, and there'll be time for questions at the end of um, this group of talks um, to talk about Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which you can imagine is relevant in 2020 um, given the current era um, and these unprecedented times that we are all uh, faced with right now. Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, as you know, is named for the octopus trap shown here. Um, Takotsubo is the Japanese word for octopus trap, and it is the shape that the left ventricle takes on uh, in this setting in the majority of cases where there's hyperkinesis um, of the basal segments and then akinesis of the mid to apical segments. So the definition of Takotsubo is transient regional wall motion abnormalities of the left or right ventricle frequently triggered by a stressful event. These wall motion abnormalities typically extend beyond a single epicardial territory. Significant coronary artery disease is not a contraindication, but no culprit lesion should be identified on angiogram. There are usually new and reversible EKG changes. In a large registry of patients with uh, Takotsubo, ST elevation was present in 44%, ST depression in 8%, and two-wave inversion in 41%. Left bundle branch block was sometimes seen, and then QT prolongation is common and important to recognize as it may um, increase the risk of arrhythmias in these patients. <clears throat> 
Elevated NTBNP is often seen in the acute phase with a small rise in troponin that is out of proportion to the extent of the wall motion abnormalities. And there's no evidence of myocarditis, uh, again, where MRI can be helpful. LV function recovers after three to six months, sometimes in uh, a matter of days, as we've seen in some of our ill hospitalized patients. Uh, the epidemiology of this disease is that it does account for about 1% to 2% of acute coronary syndromes. 90% of cases occur in postmenopausal women with an average age of about 67. This disease has a worse prognosis when it's seen in men uh, and when it's seen uh, in association with a physical trigger. So what is the pathophysiology? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it is poorly understood. Um, this is uh, on the left, a schematic in patients who had functional brain MRIs, and they compared the brains of patients who had Habitakotsubo syndrome to control patients. And they found that the connectivity of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems was decreased in patients who had Takotsubo. So there certainly is a brain-heart connection that we're beginning to understand a little bit better. Um, so people are predisposed uh, to develop Takotsubo in response to a trigger. And these triggers can be many, um, both emotional and physical stresses. And the thought is that any of these intense stresses leads to an increase in cal catecholamines release of neuropeptide Y, which then has direct cardio-inhibitory effects on the heart, um, as well as acute microvascular dysfunction. And this leads to essentially stunning or edema and transient dysfunction of the left ventricle, which we've come to know as Takotsubo syndrome. You can see listed on the right side of the screen some of the risk factors. Um, that are seen in patients with Takotsubo, female sex, age, and then some psychiatric disorders, um, substance abuse disorder, and, and in particular, marijuana seems to predispose patients probably because it increases neuropeptide Y. There are different anatomical variants. Um, the most common is the apical ballooning, uh, which I showed you in the first picture that occurs in about 80% of patients. Um, but we also see a midventricular form um, where the mid segments, it's shown here in this still frame on echocardiogram, the mid segments are akinetic and then the uh, apex and the base are relatively preserved. Um, and there can also be the inverted form where the base is akinetic and the apex is, is preserved, but that's much more rare, along with biventricular um, Takotsubo. Um, cardiac MRI can be helpful in the acute phase. You can usually see edema, but you don't usually see a lot of macroscopic fibrosis or scarring. Um, and it can also be helpful in identifying left ventricular thrombus, which um, we worry about in patients who have significant um, myocardial dysfunction. So these are some of the complications that we wanna look out for in the acute phase in the hospital. Um, acute heart failure, left ventricular outflow tract, mitral regurgitation, which I'll show you on echocardiogram in a second, and even cardiogenic shock. Um, there's also um, some increased risk of atrial fibrillation and then LV thrombus, I just want to mention, occurs in probably about two to 8% of patients. So it needs to be at least considered um, that patients might uh, be anticoagulated for a time until their heart muscle can recover. Um, it's been my practice to be fairly aggressive with them because I have seen thromboembolic complications, which are avoidable, I think, if the bleeding risk is felt to be low. And then obviously the, the complication we worry about most is, is an acute arrhythmia such as torsades, um, which is shown here. Um, so these patients will often get these deep symmetric T wave inversions and marked QT prolongation, which sets up the um, possibility of a PVC um, induced torsades. Um, and then this is just looking at long-term outcomes, um, major adverse cardiac events over a 10-year period are significant. Um, the recurrence rate I typically quote to patients um, over a five-year period is about um, 5%, most commonly occurring within the first eight weeks to four years. <laughs> 
Um, and just quickly, I'll show an echocardiogram example. Um, here you can see hyperkinesis of the basal segments of the LV, and then the um, mitral valve shown here, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is actually being drawn into the left out ventricular outflow tract. And that's where the mechanism of obstruction is with that hyperkinetic base. And then the, the mitral valve leaflet coming in there. Um, and that can also lead to mitral regurgitation um, shown here on this slide um, because of the dysfunction of, of the, uh, the anterior leaflet or the failure of it to close. Um, so the treatment of Takotsubo, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Again, there's no randomized trials. In all these data, none of these medications has really been shown to have major benefit, although we do typically use them. So beta blockers with the idea that we potentially block future catecholamine surges and decrease the risk of arrhythmias. ACE inhibitors, when the ejection fraction is low and the blood pressure will tolerate it, we use. And then again, aspirin and statins, really probably less benefit. So in summary, Takotsubo syndrome should always be considered in the differential of ST elevations as it does account for about one to 2% of acute coronary syndromes, especially in patients where there's an acute physical or emotional stress. Um, and if the EKG doesn't show reciprocal changes or new Q waves, which you might expect with an acute infarct. And if the troponin is not as high as you would predict based on the extent of wall motion abnormalities. It's important to review the TTE images and consider anticoagulation until a repeat can be performed in two to three months. There's limited data for ACE and beta blockers, but we do use them at least for the short term. And the recurrence rate is felt to be low, about 5%. Um, so with that, I think I'm out of time. Um, it's been a privilege to be part of this great program, and I'll be happy to answer questions um, after this. Thanks.